fundamental error in our thinking is that we assume the world is endless. This is not the case. We are living in a full world. Just think about fishing fish. We think that if we have one boat to catch 1,000 fish, if we have 1,000 boats, we can catch 1 million fish. Well, this is unfortunately not the case. We are living in a quality world and not in a quantity world. Since we are in an industrialized society, the world is full not just with people, with boats, with companies, but also with a lot of pollution. Previously, the world was big, the world was vast, and pollution did not hurt too much. This has all changed. When you go with the plane to Borneo, you might expect to see lush rainforest with orangutans, with pygmy elephants, with monkeys, with mammals, with birds. You do, but the pockets where you can see those amazing, amazing biodiversity, they're getting smaller and smaller. Instead, what you see is something like this. So this is a part of the rainforest along the coastline of Borneo, which has been flooded and is being prepared to be used as palm oil plantation. In palm oil plantation, we do not have any pygmy elephants, we do not have any orangutans, because they do not find any food there. We currently live in the age of the Anthropocene. Many of you might have been to New York, to Manhattan, and have seen these amazing skyscrapers and this very, very impressive city which people have built over the last centuries. If you think about Manhattan, how it looked before people arrived, it looks like you can see on the left of the image. It's a vast, green, beautiful area. One of the problems of today's economy is that we have an overheating economy. And in the world, most of the companies are not centered around the people, but around very, very fast revenue. So everybody wants to get rich fast, and everybody wants to have a good life. And in many cases, we do not think about the generations after us. We do not think, for example, about the seventh generation. This is one of the key words I was very much impressed when I was reading about Aboriginal societies. Aboriginal societies think in their actions about the seventh generation after them. Just think if our economy would change in a way that they also in their actions think about the future generations. Everything would be different. Currently, unfortunately, growth became religion-like and since we have billions of people to feed, we need to do a lot of things that are not good for the environment. If we need to feed so many people, we either need to intensify our agricultural approaches, which results in pollution, or we are claiming more and more and more land, like you saw in Borneo, which decreases the pockets, the isolated pockets where you have free nature living, and it increases the genetic separation. And we result in something like the sixth mass extinction of species, where we are at the moment. So the rate of extinction is tremendously accelerated compared to pre-industrial times because of the way we are doing the things we are doing. But I'm going to show you some approaches how we could do things differently and how we could do things better. We do not need to see ourselves just as consumers and feel helpless. We do not need to confuse brand with real quality. And we definitely do not need to destroy living nature, which is worth billions of dollars for a revenue of just a couple of thousand of dollars. When I was growing up, when I went to primary school, 
I did not want to attend the voluntary afternoon classes. I instead was leaving as fast as possible and I went out with my cat. What I did with my cat, I was living in the countryside, was I was sitting with him in the grass. I was watching the insects. We were sitting in front of my souls. We were visiting the neighbors. And I was just sitting there while he was waiting for mice to catch and watch the insects and the bees. And it was such an amazing and beautiful world that I connected to this world very, very much. And I decided for my future work, for my future work as a scientist, I'm a physicist, to do something for this environment. And when I do something for the environment, I of course do it for all of us. We all need to change. It's just not acceptable that we have such monocultures where we have one species of plant or if we have these big, big places where we are breeding the chicken or the cattle. If you have one disease, it spreads like a hurricane through the monocultures and through the animals and it's very, very dangerous and it puts us also at risk that we start to starve. And I think if we want to think change, we need to start to be critical. And we can only start critical thinking if we are understanding the principles behind. So education, good education of the young, keeping them curious, keeping them questioning things is just absolutely, absolutely basic. And one of the ways to either keep people curious or to make them curious again, I found out is to go with them to the outside, to go with them to living nature. I was for seven years living in amazing and beautiful Malaysia, where you have rainforests, where you have many still wild animals like tapirs and many other beauties. And when you go with kids, when you go with the youth, when you go with grown-ups to the forest, they change, they start to be curious, they start to look at the things, they start to see the magic in their encounter of living nature, which is beautiful in itself. And actually, there are so many things we can learn from living nature. I just give you one example of one plant. This is a pitcher plant from Borneo. So it's a very slippery surface inside, and you have some juices, down inside, which would then, you know, dissolve the insect so that the plant can eat all the nutrients it gets from the insect. So this slippery insect inside is built from wax structures, and we people can use these wax structures for very different interesting attempts. The first one is we can construct species-specific physical pesticides. So normally you think about chemical pesticides. So you are, you know, putting the pesticides on your agricultural field and then not just the type of is insect you want to attack dies, but many, many others. The bees have problems, the people who eat it have problems from the chemicals and because they are toxic and you might also protect the agricultural plant which you want to protect. If you use physical pesticides based just on the structure of the wax crystals, which have a specific structure and grow, uh, breakage characteristic, which is adapted to the feet of the insect which wants to eat this specific plant, this insect does not want to crawl over these structures anymore, it does not land anymore, it learns that this plant is not good for it to land, and these wax structures, if they for example are made from pitcher plant waxes, or from grapes, or from plums, are absolute not toxic or poisonous to any other species of insect. They can walk over it without any problem, and we can eat it without any problem. That's one example what we can learn from pitcher plant waxes. The second one is, and this is a very, very sad story, um, every day in Europe, 240,000 birds die because they fly against windows. And they fly against windows because they do not see the windows. And now, birds see ultraviolet light. For example, spider webs are reflecting ultraviolet light. So birds do not fly into spider webs. 
just imagine, and there is now a big research project going on, which is exactly investigating this, just imagine you're building wax crystals of the specific sites that reflects the UV light so that the birds see it and do not fly against it and do not die. We can, with these slippery waxes, of course, make slippery surfaces where dirt does not stick to, where insects cannot crawl up. You know, the insects, they fall into the pitcher plant, but they cannot crawl up. They would always slide back and die in the digestive juices. And another magic thing is when these wax structures are not used anymore, they can serve as food or fertilizer for other animals, for other organisms to eat them. And not flat is two words, which brings us to the next slide, because all these functionalities of wax structures and of many other surface functionalities which we look at are based on structured surfaces. And this is something we people are just starting to think. We can, for example, make beautiful colors inspired by butterflies by making periodic nanostructures, where just the structures make the color. You do not need to use any toxic elements. This uh, principle, structure rather than material, is a very, very important principle in my area, which is biomimetics, learning from living nature for applications in engineering. And if we start to think in structures, and structures in plants, in animals, in people, are just amazing. I put here these uh, walk structures of this uh, Pinia nobilis, Volemia nobilis plant from uh, New Caledonia. And I put a scale bar there for you. So this, this white bar here is 1,000 nanometers long, one micrometer long, which means this is just just uh, one hundredth of the diameter of one of your hairs. So just imagine how small these structures are, and they make functional, uh, functional uh, processes on the plant surface. We have integrated functionality in such structures, and again, if we copy, if we learn from living nature for applications in technology, we can also transfer sustainability aspects and aspects that we do not find in most of our current technical approaches. One of my biggest shocks, I have to admit, I ever had in my whole life was when I heard that uncontacted tribes, people who do not want to have contact with civilization, they call us demons. They do not want to have contact with us. They live in the jungle of India, of Malaysia, of uh, the Amazon. They do not want to have contact with us because they think we are destroying the world and we are going on a wrong path. I think we, at the moment, might head in a wrong direction. We are destroying a lot, but I think there is hope. And the hope I see when I go with children, when I go with the youth, when I go with grown-ups to the forest, to the outside, when they are starting to reconnect this band of love to living nature, to intensify the band of love to living nature. Because if this is here, everything else will follow. And I think we will be able to develop good technologies and to stop and prevent further catastrophes on this beautiful planet. Thank you.